places in the Holy Land, the Mount of Olives. Behind me are some incredible spots, like the Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus would often meet with the disciples before going over to the temple. It was also the place where he prayed, my soul is overwhelmed to the point of death, just before being crucified. You'll also see the Kidron Valley, where the disciples would cross when going over to Jerusalem. And of course, you see the old city of Jerusalem as well. When Jesus would visit his friends, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus in Bethany, he would have traveled back to Jerusalem on a pathway somewhere near here that would have led him over the Mount of Olives. Jesus loved spending time with these friends and would visit them often. If you're familiar at all with the story of Martha, you probably remember her and her sister Mary. Now stay with me, even if you're very familiar with this story, because I'm going to impact something fascinating. I'll call it a fascinating twist that I never realized until studying these seven I Am statements of Jesus. So the story about Mary and Martha is found in Luke chapter 10. Mary and Martha are at home, and when Jesus came to their town to visit, they welcomed him into their home. When Jesus starts to teach them, Mary is sitting at Jesus' feet, listening intently. And Martha, as it says in Luke, is distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. Do you remember this story? So Martha went to Jesus and asked him to tell Mary to get up and help her with all this work. But instead of cooperating, Jesus praised Mary for choosing to sit and listen and corrected Martha for worrying and working instead of being just with him. Now let's be honest. If I were to pass out a survey today and ask you to tell me the defining story of Martha's life, I think most of us would sadly recall this story. And honestly, if I were Martha, I really wouldn't want this conversation with Jesus to be the one everyone remembers. It's like that uncle that tells your most embarrassing moment as his favorite family story that he loves to share at every Thanksgiving meal. You know, most of us are quick to define our lives by moments, some good moments, but then sometimes the not so great moments that we seem to want to entangle around our identity. I've seen this firsthand in my parenting journey. When my oldest daughter, Hope, was born, she had the most angelic sweetheart lips. She had these blonde ringlet curls and chubby cheeks just begging to be kissed over and over. She was pure sweetness wrapped in a pink blanket. And then came the day this creature pursed those lips, gripped the toy in her hand, tilted her blonde ringlets, and screamed, mine, mine, mine. It was a small red toy that my friend had let her borrow. The plan was to use this toy as temporary entertainment until it was time to go. But of course, when it was time to go, my friend's child was just shining her halo with one hand while happily handing over her yellow toy with the other hand. Awesome. My, my, my daughter screamed as every eye in the coffee shop stared at me. I could feel a burning flush of embarrassment rush from my chest to my face. I pried the toy from Hope's hand. I thanked my friend. I hoisted my kicking and screaming daughter out of the wooden high chair. And then, in slow motion, I watched in horror as she kicked my paper coffee cup from my hand and sent it careening across the floor. I felt my fragile identity as a mom just melt into the puddle of spilled coffee. What happened to my angel? My beautiful, beautiful daughter was not so angelic. Well, it's been years since that day in the coffee shop, but oh, how I wish I could go back with my little inexperienced mommy self on that drive home that day. And I would say, look, your daughter, Lisa, is a child in need of a parent. She needs to be taught. And some of your best teaching opportunities, well, they'll come when she puts her sin nature on display. Don't fear or fret or feel like this is some sort of failure on your part. Her outside demonstrations are an internal indication for her need for guidance. So guide her, love her, and always remember, be the parent, not her friend, not her buddy, the parent. That daughter is now 22 years old, and hope is an absolute delight. But her growing up years were not always easy. There were many, many times where she made mistakes and put her sin nature on display, Even in those seasons where I felt like she was doing everything opposite of what I taught her, 
Eventually, I could see all that parenting was in her. Nothing was wasted. Even the days where I thought I was an epic failure as a mom, those days were still good investments. But I had to keep the perspective as her mom to use her faults and frailties as maturing moments, not as liabilities that labeled her. Which is why I feel we must revisit Martha and forever redefine the story she's most remembered for. In this week's personal study time, you read another story of Martha, the one where her brother Lazarus became ill and Mary and Martha sent a message to Jesus, their friend they knew could heal him. The message said, Lord, the one you love is sick. And I'm sure they fully expected him to drop what he was doing and come right away. Jesus, though he was not in Bethany at that time, got the message, but then did something that must have seemed shocking. He waited two more days before leaving. And then the journey took an additional two days. So by the time he got there, his friend Lazarus had been dead four days. Four days is important because back in the time of Jesus, they didn't have modern medical technology to see when someone's heart stopped. So they would often wait to bury a person until they'd been unconscious and presumed dead for three days. And many people believe that the spirit of the deceased hovered over the body for three days before someone was truly rendered dead. Well, since Lazarus had been dead four days, he was clearly beyond any dispute, dead, dead. So when Jesus showed up to Bethany, Martha met him on the road. Let's pick up there in John chapter 11, starting in verse 17. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Now pay attention to verse 22 because I think we see evidence of Martha maturing. Starting in verse 22, it says, but I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who has come into the world. This is the twist I've been so excited to share. Martha, the busy one. Martha, the distracted one. Martha, the one I'm so prone to be just like, became Martha, the chosen one. The one Jesus chose to reveal this glorious I am statement to. I am the resurrection and the life. Wow, I don't know about you, but this is the story I want to forever tie Martha's name to, not Martha the distracted one, or Martha the demanding one, but Martha, the one Jesus set apart with great favor to be the first one to know his resurrection power and the full life he offers. She would hear it first from the lips of her friend Jesus. Then she would see it in action as the miracle-working Lord raised her brother from the dead. And then she would see it when her Savior himself was crucified and rose again, leaving his tomb empty. This wasn't just an event that happened then. It's happening now. The resurrected king is bringing his resurrection power and his full life to you. Yes, our physical bodies will die and we will receive a resurrected body in eternity. But in the meantime, when Jesus says he is the resurrection and the life, he's providing a way for us to live, really live. Now, there are two things I want you to consider. First, has there been a time in your life that you remember specifically surrendering your heart to Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior? I'm not talking about just going 